and I'm going to talk, I'm Adrian Groot, and I'm going to talk to you about KDE's governance model. Um, a little bit about me, I did a PhD in computer science in completely obscure and relatively useless things. Uh, but I've been doing free software since 1989. Uh, there's an asterisk there because I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to swear that it was always free software. Sometimes it was open source, and when I was young and the world was new, um, free software was, was slightly less well defined than it is nowadays. I've been working on KDE for 17 years, I guess, and nowadays I work on Kalamatis, which is a system installer. Uh, it installs Linux systems. If you have ever installed anything other than the big five Linux distros, you've probably used Kalamatis. Um, so we're going to talk about governance and what govern what's governance for? Governance is really about risk management. Um, as a free software project. So I'm speaking to you all as free software project people. I'm going to assume that you've got some wonderful piece of free software that you want to publish to the world, uh, bring into the world, and you want to keep it safe. And that means you need to do some risk management. Um, so maybe this is going to be like business 101, and it's, it might be very boring for you all. Um, because what kind of risks are we looking at managing? Uh, risks to your assets, the things you have, and there's also existential risks, risks to your very being, uh, which sounds much more dramatic than it is. Um, but so there are risks that need to be managed. I mean, you're, you're going to be publishing stuff, you're going to be holding events, and you're going to be bringing people together, and things can go wrong. And when things go wrong, you can do th two things. You can trust that it'll all work out in the end, uh, or you can have some kind of governance, some kind of rules uh, to, let, to figure out what to do. Uh, I'm going to just ask all of you out in the audience, who has read the Code of Conduct for this conference? That's actually better than I expected. About a third of you. I like it. That's good. Uh, because the code of conduct for this conference governs our behavior here. And that's a form of risk management. I mean, if I do something terrible up here on stage, there's governance, there's rules, and we can all, all of you are empowered to say, the rules say that Adrian shouldn't have done that. Uh, and that, that's important because that's it takes away real room. It takes away my ability to go, ah, it wasn't that bad. It takes away the organizer's ability to say, ah, it wasn't that bad. Right? So that's why governance is important. It's risk management. I can't do the terrible things that I want to do. Um, I don't want to do terrible things, actually. So <clears throat> what kind of terrible things can happen? Um, terrible things can happen to your source code. I mean, you're a free software project, so you're interested in free software. And the four freedoms are important to you. So, one of the things you need to govern is the copyright. The copyright on your source code. That's sort of your most important thing. And how do you deal with governing your source code? You put a license on it. So, I'm going <coughs> to... This is sort of the, the business 101, the free software project 101 part of the talk. Um, you should pick a license that actually expresses what you feel, what your moral or your business objectives are for your free software project. Um, because the license you pick says a lot about how you want to be a free software project. Um, I would advise you to pick one of the big five licenses, because the big five licenses are well understood. People know most people have a pretty good understanding of what a big five license means. What are the, my list of big five is CC0, which is, y'all go doing something, something useful. Two clause BSD, which is, do something useful, but keep the, keep the headers intact. Uh, Apache license version two, which is, have fun, 
but think about patents, and the LGPL version 3 and the GPL version 3. Pick one of those big five, whichever one best fits your, uh, your free software project moral and stick with it. Please don't write any lessons, please don't pick one of the obscure ones. I mean, there's 80 odd licenses that the OSI thinks are okay, but it gets complicated. If you're a free software project and you're going to hold copyrights and you've decided on your license, please decide on a contributor license agreement or a fiduciary license agreement or decide that you don't want one. Frankly, I'd advise you not to want one, right? The Linux kernel does fine without a copyright assignment, a bit of paper. It's a big, convoluted mess of copyrights, and that's fine. Uh, but if you do want to have a CLA or an FLA, decide early on. Because the earlier you decide, the easier it is to get it right. Um, a copyright, uh, a CLA, uh, tries to assign copyright. An FLA uh, is something that uh, was pioneered, I think, by the Free Software Foundation Europe, and it does an assign and take back of license rights, um, which is much nicer. Anyway, once you've got the license, make sure everyone knows what it is. Please, please, license, uh, put the license in all of your header files or in everything that gets installed. Um, Right, so that's sort of the, the license part of governance in, uh, uh, in your free software project. Aside from your source code, which is kind of intangible, right? It lives in, in repositories somewhere. It's in a Git repository or a Mercurial repository, whatever you like. Uh, but you've also got tangibles, right? You're a free software project, you've got a domain, and you've got uh, Maybe you've got a trademark, maybe you've got a logo. Get those things organized. And somebody should own these things, right? Your domain has to be registered by someone. And I've seen it happen that free software projects or other projects uh, register domains by one of the contributors. And then that later becomes a problem. Because if that contributor leaves, that contributor leaves along with the domain. And it really sucks if KDE.org, for instance, suddenly was used for something else because the person registering it went away. So pick an organizational form, and there's, there's a variety of uh, organizational forms available, and use that as early as possible. Um, there's an organization in Europe called the Commons Conservancy. The Commons Conservancy provides uh, sort of uh, off-the-shelf organizations. If you, as a free software project, need an organization, so a Stiftung, uh, it produces, it spits out Dutch Stichtingen, uh, which is an organizational form you can use. Um, so there's umbrella organizations that uh, can do these things for you. You can also join the KDE umbrella if you happen to like KDE. Make sure your organization is socialized. It should be part of your complete community. Um, okay, so those are sort of two things. You use your license to, to protect your things, your source code. You use your organization to protect the things you own, right? Your hardware, your domains, etc. But then there's sort of existential threats. Um, threats to uh, the being the core being of your free software project. And so you, you, you need to protect those as well. And that's what you need a different kind of governance for. That's where you start working on your processes. Um, I'm going to advise you to write down your core values. Make sure that it's really clear to all of your contributors what you care about and what is important. Um, once you've got that, write up, a, write up a vision as well. If you can tell people we want to reach that. We want the world to look like so. You've got a better story for potential contributors than if you've got sort of this wishy-washy, yeah, we're gonna make cool stuff. Um, I've 
recently been told by, by people, I was at a startup event and they were like, yeah, it's really nice to have projects that tell me where they're going, that give me a really long roadmap, because if they do, I know beforehand what, how I can contribute, what I should contribute. It makes it easier for me, as a sort of a drive-by person, to give stuff to the, the project. Um, it's pretty important, actually, also to, to tell people how to get into your project, and also how to get out. I mean, after all, some people will eventually leave. So protect your organization, your free software project, by basically I'm telling you to write documentation. Gosh, that's really boring. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, if you write this down, if you make it clear from the beginning, your free software project will be stronger because you've got this protection against people coming in and, and not understanding you. You've already told them. Um, that's long-term stuff, right? These are existential threats. Uh, you want your long-term goals to be figured out. But whenever you're doing things, you know, just day-to-day, -day, um, you should also be managing your day-to-day -day risks, which is what I call procedures. I see procedures as fairly short-term things. Make sure you have a code of conduct. Please, if you're setting up a free software project, get that code of conduct figured out as soon as you possibly can. Um, there's lots of different kinds of codes of conduct. You can make big ones, little ones. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, and anyone who, is, who was in Patricia's talk has heard something about the importance of codes of conduct already. Um, as you create your free software project, Figure out a committer's guide as well. Please tell people how they can best contribute, what the right mechanisms are and the procedures, because nothing is more frustrating for a potential contributor than to show up, say, I've got this cool stuff, and then nothing happens. If you were in Emma's talk about bug triage, get your, get your triage figured out quickly as well, because every bug report uh, is something that you need to deal with, and Again, for a bug reporter, having no response to a bug is a really bad experience when interacting with a free software project. So make sure you've got this committer's guide figured out. Get an events guide as well, right? When you've got a nice event like this, um, so FOSS North is organized by the FOSS North organization. That's Johan's job, it's your job, sort of. You, you've taken it upon you, at least, for which I thank you. Um, but if you're running a free software project, then events are sort of incidental. They're part of what makes your project fun, but it's not your core business. Even so, make sure you understand how events work. Because an event can be really expensive. It can be expensive in terms of money, simply because, you know, if you don't figure your budget out properly. But an, ex an event can also be really expensive in terms of PR. And that's where we sort of come back to the code of conduct. If stuff goes wrong at an event, it can blow up in your face. So, by writing, about, by writing down how you want your event to be, events to be run, you're already managing the risks that the event can bring with it. So, <clears throat> I've given this fairly generic Business 101 talk about get this stuff done, figured out as quickly as possible when you're doing a free software project because that's going to save your butt later. Um, but there's also this, there's a couple of extremes. I mean, you can, you can keep your governance really lean and not write down a lot of stuff and you can make your code of conduct be, be excellent. Right? That's, that's lightweight. It's easy to do. And, but then you're sort of in this, this wilderness of, well, I won't call it confusion, but there's a lot of wriggle room and, and, and sort of scrub land that no one's explored. And so you get in this be good or be excellent wilderness is what I call it. There's too much, um, too much underspecified. And way at the other end of the governance extremes, there's this ISO 9002 swamp. You get totally bogged down in writing 
writing down everything that can go wrong and everything that should be done. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't give you complete uh, advice, but I'm telling you, don't go to the one extreme, don't stay in the other extreme. Please go looking for some, some place in the middle. And those one third of you who have read the, the Code of Conduct for this conference, you've already seen that it says more than just be excellent. It says less than, I mean, it doesn't have this big long list of don't do this, don't do that. Um, so it, 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 it is somewhere in the middle. I, I kind of like the Code of Conduct. So I've talked so far about fairly generic things. Um, Looking at KDE in particular, KDE is an old project. It is 21 years old. That's old enough to drive. It's old enough to drink in most of the United States. Um, it's also old enough to have learned some of these things the hard way. And KDE definitely didn't do things the way I just told you to. It took many years to get all of these bits and pieces figured out. But so I'm going to pretend that KDE did this in the way I told you to. Um, and it picked, early on, the LGPL and the GPL as an expression of its moral commitment to uh, not only free software, but also to reciprocal free software. So that was sort of its original moral position. KDE has picked an optional fiduciary license agreement. We worked together with the Free Software Foundation Europe to um, make it possible to, uh, for an individual contributor to KDE to assign their copyright rights to the, uh, the organization behind KDE and then immediately get a complete license back so that they can, con can continue to exercise almost all of their rights uh, under copyright. Why did we do that? Um, one of the things a fiduciary license agreement solves is the problem of, I'm sorry, death. Contributors will die at some point. And uh, making sure that the copyrights are well organized at that point um, can help. It certainly reduces your administrative burden eventually. And knowing where your copyrights are coming from is easier than that the giant tangle that is Linux. But again, that's not a choice you can make. And KDE has chosen to make the FLA optional, but encouraged. Um, after a couple of years of people building KDE in the late 90s, uh, the KDE Association was created. This is a German association. Um, why is it a German association? Well, because a lot of the original contributors were Germans. Um, this has its ups and downsides. Um, uh, German association law is quite strong, but it also brings all kinds of administrative burden. So if you're going to be doing a free software organization, shop around. Look for places that give you a, an organization that is sufficiently lightweight for what you want to do. The EV, Eingetragener Verein, the association, um, it's, it's the organization that actually owns the domains and trademarks and all of the, the materials we have. So if you buy a t-shirt at our stand out front, then uh, you're buying it from the EV. Um, the EV itself organizes one conference per year. Uh, we call it Academy. Academy contains a number of administrative actions that have to happen uh, because we're a German association. Um, and KDE EV itself also offers uh, umbrella services. So we, we don't only host and support KDE proper, which is the KDE frameworks development and plasma development and the KDE applications. We also offer um, sort of an umbrella to uh, Wiki to Learn, which is an Italian, an Italian organization dedicated to educational materials. Um, the way we offer those, uh, those umbrella services is when people are interested in getting lightweight uh, organization and they believe in our, sort of, you know, the, the rest of our protection, protective 
uh, or moral choices. Um, so Katie, I talked about processes and procedures. In KDE, the processes are fixed in the manifesto and the vision. We spent, I think, two years arguing back and forth on mailing lists about the manifesto. And the manifesto is, is, is a lot like the Communist Manifesto. It, it says a bunch of things in very strong language, and then this is how it should be. Um, those are sort of our requirements for being part of our community. But making that clear, that helps anyone who shows up say, oh no, I, I can subscribe, I'll buy your newsletter. Uh, we also have a KDE vision, we, can, we have actually written down where we want the world to go. Um, so that was our processes. I'll show you those documents in a moment. Um, there's also a KDE code of conduct. The code of conduct is actually looks a lot like uh, the conference code we have here. Um, it is enforced by something called the community working group. We have a couple of people that uh, whose task within the KDE community is to make sure that things work well. And they also operate as trusted, trusted parties. If there is a problem, you go to the community working group because the community working group has the discretion but also the power to deal with interpersonal problems that show up. So if we look at the KDE manifesto for a minute, um, yeah, this is readable, good. We're a community of technologists, designers, writers, and advocates who work to ensure freedom for all people through our software. Okay, probably the Communist Manifesto starts with a more literary, more literary oomph. But this is at least our core value. We're a community. Um, and so by saying this at the beginning, we've got, we've got our, sort of the rules that are going to govern our whole activity picked out in three, six, you know, six points right here. Um, we've got our vision also governs the things we do, the things we participate in. Um, so we're, we're, this is also readable, uh, we've, we're looking for a world for everyone where your digital life is properly under your own control. Right, this helps us pick and choose sort of what, what kind of activities we do. It, it reminds us also every now and then that when we're producing software that will spy on our users, we go, hmm, that might not be the best idea. Spying on our users is not compatible with our vision, so we should not create this software. Which means that if you install a KDE desktop, it will actually, it won't actively undermine your privacy. Let's put it that way. Here's an overview of the KDE Code of Conduct, and I probably resembles the, the, the one for this conference a lot. Um, personally, a bunch of stuff could be better in KDE governance. Our FLA is due for an update. It hasn't, uh, th there's been some changes in legal thinking, which is why we need to update it. Our onboarding story, um, Emma talked about that this morning. Is, is you know when you get people need to know better what uh, what they're doing, how how their interaction is. Um, so our onboarding stuff should be better. Uh, the code of conduct we have here actually offers a fair amount of wriggle room. I would personally like to reduce the amount of wriggling that's possible in there. Um, I. I've got, if, if we have time, I've got some examples of too much and too little. Um, and other than that, in, in KDE, I'm perfectly willing to admit that our, a lot of our engineering stuff could be better. Uh, in particular, Ed, Emma's talk was, for me, very educational about how we should be dealing with our own Bugzilla. So that sort of wraps up what I was going to say. Um, right, I had general governance advice, KDE's governance roughly follows my own advice, but uh, it, it could be better. And if you have questions, please ask them now.
Maybe this is very specific about copyright law, but maybe you know or anyone else know. So what happens when a person passes away? Where does the... Uh, uh, and there is no CLA or anything like that. Who, who does it uh, belong to them? So, um, your copyright in the European Union, continental Europe, um, doesn't have moral rights, so we can leave that out of the way for the minute. Um, but basically, your copyright is an asset of you, and so it passes to your heirs. Um, at the same time, if you have published something under the GPL, or whatever license you've published it under, um, that license still applies because you've conveyed the copy to somebody else and they've received that copy under the license. So what can happen is that your heirs decide to relicense. One of the things they could decide is to relicense your code under a non-free license. Certainly if your heirs don't understand software licensing that could happen. But it doesn't actually affect anything because the code you've already conveyed, I mean, you're dead. You're not making any more code changes. Nobody commits to a GitHub repo. Actually, you could probably set up if this and then that rules for that. But, uh, yeah, let's talk about weird corner cases later. Okay, so it goes to your ears. Short question, short answer. There's another question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, is it uh, creating a foundation or something like that for mm -hmm. a, is it for a project? When do you think that you should take a step from being just a GitHub repo and being institutionalize it legally? Uh, because if we, if I'm just a one developer, I don't need a, a foundation. But if I'm maybe two, three people, it's more relevant. When is this? Then when do you need to think or think we step from GitHub repo to legal yeah. institution? I'm, I'm going to give my favorite lawyerly answer. It depends. Um, as soon as you, it, it looks like your project is going to need to be owning stuff. You should be thinking about uh, some kind of organization. Um, so yeah, almost as soon as people start, you know. As soon as you decide, hey, I need more than a vanity uh, domain, or hey, this project looks like it might last two, three years, that's, that's a point at which you should start thinking about an organization. That's really early, I mean, because most people are, are throwing stuff out there. Um, that's why something like the Commons Conservancy exists. Um, in, the, in North America, the uh, Software Freedom Conservancy uh, does something similar, uh, right? So there, there's very lightweight ways of, get, of getting an organization off the ground. But the, so do it early, but do it lightweight. Uh, I was wondering the choice of your license, the LGPL and the GPL, was that a problem in the early years when there were still question marks around the open source character of Qt? Um, it was never a question for KDE um, because the stuff we were making, we, we could license and we decided to license it under the LGPL. And whether the resulting software could actually be legally distributed was a problem that we went, eh, who cares? Um, simply because Qt at the time, we're talking about 1996. Uh, was under the QPL, which wasn't an actual free software license. Um, but that hasn't been... And so, back in 1996, we said, eh, who cares? But that hasn't been a problem since uh, the first Qt uh, actual free software release, which was uh, 1998, 1999. So, yeah, sometimes you can, sometimes you can ignore the license. 
I guess we have time for two more questions, and I'm sorry for the next speaker, we're going to steal like a couple of minutes, but since it's the last talk, I think it's going to be fun. Uh, hi, I'll get back uh, to the wiggle room that you mentioned yeah. about uh, the code of conduct. As the projects get larger and maybe more stakes are involved and the significance of the software increases, do you think the code of conduct should eventually become legally enforceable, meaning that it should actually be written by a lawyer in a way that it cannot be interpreted differently and so on? Um, I don't think lawyerly language helps that much. Um, and legally enforceable is, is tough as well. I mean, because, you know, anyone can walk into this room. Um, I'd, I'd hate to have to sign a waiver before attending this conference. I'd hate to, to uh, have to sign a waiver before speaking at this conference. So, I'd say no. Uh, even as the project grows bigger, don't weigh it down too much with, with lawyerly stuff. Remember, there's always still the law. It's still there. Um, so that, that's, you know, if, if you're lucky, the law has your back. Hi. Um, yes, it's a fine question. Um, a quick heckle first. All right. But first, thank you for your, um, for your talk. Uh, I think the heckle is that you slightly implied that the CC0 Creative Commons license is OSI approved. It is not. Um, so, yeah. All right. Just to let you know. Um, the other question is uh, more about the code of conduct and things like this. So, generally, developers are in, have their fingers in many pies. They contribute to many um, communities, to projects, and things like this. So, one question is that what do you do with someone who is obviously violating a code of conduct but not necessarily yours? So what do you do about bad, basically, what do you do about bad behavior outside of KDE by a KDE developer? And because what, their offense could not have happened, uh, for, I mean, they did it elsewhere, for example. Yeah, so that, that, that's a very relevant question. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I exist in the KDE community, but I also have my own Twitter handle, um, and I could claim that my Twitter happens outside the KDE community. I mean, that would be an example. Um, I think we're fortunate enough to have not encountered this yet, um, but I personally believe, so this isn't policy of the project, I personally believe that um, yeah, if you're showing bad behavior in another online community or a similar community, um, that should that should be taken very seriously, as if it is a code of conduct violation. Um, I'm hesitant to uh, drag too much of people's real physical life into the short answer. It depends. Sorry. So, thanks a lot, Adrian, and I guess one last round of applause for him.